Hi everybody, we've come to our last lecture, lecture 9. And this is the Roman trial, the second part of the Passion narrative and the execution of Jesus. And then we move into the resurrection. So we look at the Roman trial under the famous Pontius Pilate. This is immediately followed by the crucifixion, the death, the burial of Jesus. Mark includes the story with the discovery of the empty tomb. A later editor has made an appendix out of which we call the, the longer ending, which is really a compendium of resurrection appearances. A little summary of them. We'll see Mark revealing Jesus there as the humble King, Messiah and the Beloved. Rather, we see Mark revealing Jesus to us as the humble King, the Messiah and the Beloved Son of God. So we've got six sections. Jesus before Governor Pilate. The crucifixion of Jesus. The death of Jesus. The burial of Jesus. The tomb is empty. And then the compendium or summary of resurrection appearances. The appendix. Firstly then, Jesus' trial before Governor Pilate. The first 20 verses of chapter 15. In many ways, the Roman trial parallels the Jewish trial. And Jesus, on the whole, remains silent before all his accusers. And perhaps we're reminded by that of the suffering servant of Isaiah, who also remains dumb or silent. We see also in both of them the manipulations and the, and the lack of integrity in, in both trials. It's a, it's, they, they're both sham events, really. At the end of both trials, Jesus is mocked and abused, spat upon, beaten, mocked as a prophet by the religious authorities, spat upon, struck on the head, mocked as king by the civil authorities. The Roman trial begins after the Jewish authorities condemn Jesus and they hand him over to Pilate. The Sanhedrin doesn't have the power at that time to execute. But the Roman prefect or governor has. In most cases, once the Jewish authorities had condemned someone to death, the Roman sentence of execution crucifixion for rebels and slaves was a foregone conclusion. Pilate was procurator or prefect for 10 years in the Holy Land, 26 to 36 AD. He was considered a cruel man, a stubborn man and quite intemperate really. The capital city for him was Caesarea Maritima on the coast. But of course he would often come to the religious capital of Jerusalem for celebrations which might get out of hand, like Passover. We don't know where he held court in Jerusalem. It was either the fortress Antonia near the temple or the palace of Herod near the modern-day Jaffa Gate. His first question in the trial is, Are you the king of the Jews? Which is the Roman way of describing would-be messiahs. Jesus' re his reply is, You say so. It's quite non-committal. And it really also questions Pilate's assumptions about it all. We don't 
have any evidence outside the Gospels for the custom of releasing a prisoner at Passover time. It may just be that a prisoner named Barabbas was released at roughly the same time as Jesus was executed. And Mark could see there a rather delicious irony. Barabbas means son of the father, which is precisely how Jesus understood himself. And the so-called guardian of justice in the Holy Land, Pilate, presides over the release of a guilty man, Barabbas, instead of the innocent one, Jesus. It's clear that Pilate believes Jesus is innocent. What crime has he committed? asked Pilate to the crowd. Pilate, in Mark's eyes, comes across as weak, a crowd pleaser, lacking any real integrity and inner conviction. A little bit like Herod Antipas and how he gave in to Salome's demand for the head of John the Baptist when, um, when she danced before the, um, the great people of Galilee. Pilate hands Jesus over to the soldiers. We've seen that expression hand over a few times. The soldiers then mock Jesus as a would-be king. They dress him in purple. They place a crown on his head and strike him with a reed. The reed is the scepter the king's use. And then they led him away to crucify him. Next scene is the crucifixion. The way of the cross, is, as described in Mark, is very brief and very matter-of-fact. There are just two events that happen before the crucifixion. Simon of Cyrene is asked to help carry the cross of Jesus and Jesus is offered wine mixed with myrrh. Simon of Cyrene, Cyrene, modern-day Libya, is perhaps settled in Palestine and coming to the city for the feast. His two sons are mentioned by name, Alexander and Rufus, so possibly they are well known to Mark's audience and are drawn through their father into the Christian community. Now Simon, unlike Simon Peter, carries his cross. And reminds us that all true followers of Jesus are called to take up their cross and follow Jesus. When offered wine mixed with myrrh, Jesus did not take it. Perhaps to tell us that he wanted to remain conscious throughout his ordeal. Or perhaps he's following that vow he made at the Last Supper not to take wine until he entered the kingdom of God. Then it says, And then they crucified him. A simple, unadorned phrase. And it immediately followed by the soldiers dividing his clothes among themselves. And we're reminded of Psalm 21, a psalm of lament which which forms the backdrop, really, to significant details in, in the story. We learn it was 9am when they crucified him, and that the charge against him, the king of the Jews, was attached to the cross. Another irony, of course. We know how profoundly true that inscription is. He really is the king of the Jews. But in Pilate's eyes, it's, he put it there as a deterrent to would-be messiahs or rebels. 
We don't know whether Jesus himself was naked on the cross, which was the normal Roman practice, or whether he was allowed a loincloth out of deference to Jewish sensibilities. Another little detail. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, one on his left. We can't help, can we, but think of James and John, who had that request of sitting beside him, one on his left and one on his right, as he entered the kingdom. We remember that Jesus complained at his arrest that he was being treated like a bandit. Now he's executed with two bandits, one on each side of him. So just simple and yet profoundly evocative, the scene of his crucifixion. And now he's mocked, mocked by three groups of people. The passers-by, chief priests and scribes, and then the two bandits. Passers-by, chief priests and scribes, the two bandits. And Raymond Brown, the beautiful Raymond Brown, makes this comment. Not only the haphazard passers-by and the determined Sanhedrin enemies of Jesus, but even the wretches who share his fate all speak ill of him. On the cross, Jesus has no friends. He is a solitary righteous man, closely surrounded on all sides by enemies. We come now to the death of Jesus. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. It's true that uh, in the ancient world, cosmological signs were thought to accompany the death of any great person. For example, when Julius Caesar died, it is said that the sun was darkened. But Mark probably is not thinking about that, but he's referring to the prophet Amos in chapter 8, where we read this. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth from daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning. I will make it like the morning for an only sun. A comment then by Donahue and Harrington. The point is that the cosmos itself joins in the morning and the passing and the death of of the death of God's Son. Rather beautifully said there. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the fifth time Mark uses the aromatic original, Aramaic original for authenticity. We've already heard Talitha kum, Ephetha, Hosanna, Abba, Golgotha, each with a translation. He's quoting here the opening uh, verse of Psalm 21, giving voice to his utter abandonment by God. Jesus really has fully experienced what it means to be alone and to feel abandoned by family by disciples, and now by God. We hear some of the bystanders confusing Eloi with Elijah, but perhaps it's confusing more to the Greek reader than to the actual bystanders. And as Donahue and Harrington say, Malachi 4 says that Elijah was expected to return before the day of the Lord. A bystander then cynically asks, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and expired. The Greek word means 
to breathe one's last. Mark clearly wants us to see that Jesus gives his spirit into the hands of God. And we then hear immediately, And the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom, reminding us of when the heavens were torn open at the baptism of Jesus. Something again has profoundly happened. The divine silence has been broken. The epoch of the temple and its sacrifices is over. A new world begins with Jesus' death. The centurion who had been standing there opposite him said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Some commentators see this statement from the pagan centurion as the climax of the Gospel. This obviously good person sees that Jesus truly is God's beloved Son. It's at the moment of his death that his true identity is clear and ironically it's a pagan who sees it. Jesus is saviour of all people, pagans included. We learn finally that a group of women are standing at a distance. We note especially Mary of Magdala. This trio of women, somehow or other, stand in contrast to the three who formed the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James and John. They're vanished, whereas the women remain. Next is the burial of Jesus. In Mark's Gospel, the agony of Jesus on the cross lasts for six hours. And he dies sometime after 3 p.m. It's Friday, the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath rest. The Torah says that when someone is convicted of a crime punishable by death and is executed, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse must not remain all night upon the tree. You shall bury him on that same day, for anyone hung on a tree is under a curse. That's from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21. So they didn't have much time to bury Jesus. A pious Jew, who's not a follower of Jesus, but someone who was also looking for the kingdom of God, asks Pilate for the body. And when Pilate ascertains from the centurion that in fact Jesus is dead, he releases the body into this person's care. Joseph hastily buys a linen cloth and ties Jesus' body uh, up in this cloth and places it in a tomb hewn out of rock. So Joseph does the bare minimum as the Sabbath begins so soon. Jerusalem was surrounded by areas of, and it still is, of soft limestone rock into which people customarily cut out burial chambers. Normally the bodies would lie on a shelf for a year or two and then the bones would be placed in an ossuary, a container for the bones. Interestingly, if you go into the Holy Sepulchre church, you'll notice that there's some, there are some, um, in, in the earth itself, you can see there are some crevices where you can imagine there would have been a, a burial chamber. Raymond Brown says that first century cave tomb, tombs in the area made the site on which the Holy Sepulchre Church now stands as the most likely place for the cave tomb in which Joseph placed the body of Jesus. Now the final verse 
has Mary of Magdala and Mary the mother of Joseph taking note of where Jesus is laid. So that, of course, after the Sabbath, they can come back to the correct tomb and perform the other rituals they don't have time to do. We might note that the Passion narrative, remember, opened with a beautiful woman in Bethany anointing Jesus for his burial. And here are the faithful women who obviously have such thoughts deep in their hearts. The disciples of John the Baptist buried the body of their master. Jesus is buried by a pious stranger. Now we move into chapter 16. So that we've concluded the passion narrative and now we move into the first eight verses which are the original ending of Mark, the empty tomb. Jesus died and was buried on a Friday. It's, it, was hap it happened, of course, before the Sabbath began. So clearly everything took place on the Friday. Saturday is the Sabbath day. That's the second day. And Sunday, which began at sunset on Saturday, was therefore the third day, the day of the resurrection. Three days in a tomb. Part of the Friday, all of the Saturday, and into the Sunday. In Hosea chapter 6, we read, After two days... He will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live for him. Mark's account of the Sunday morning consists of the arrival of three women, Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Their encounter with the young man in the empty tomb happens, and their reaction to this meeting then is the last part. Many think it's a strange ending, as there are no resurrection appearances of Jesus, as all the, as the other three gospel uh, writers do have. Everyone acknowledges that chapter 16, verses 9 to 20, is a second century addition to Mark. The style is so different in those verses. 9 to 20 is missing too from many manuscripts. And some say that Mark's original ending may be lost to us. But most commentators today say that what we have now in verses 1 to 8 is exactly what Mark intended to write and how he intended to conclude his gospel. So, let's spend a moment and look more closely at those eight verses. Chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. When the women enter the empty tomb, they see a young man dressed in a white robe, seated, and they are alarmed. This is some sort of heavenly messenger. A visitation from the realm of the divine, which always frightens us when it occurs as these women are frightened. But when the, uh, what the young man says is crucial. Don't be afraid. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look. There is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. It's dense and it's full of very, very important material. In many ways, this is for our benefit, what the angel says, what the heavenly messenger says. We are all looking for Jesus of Nazareth, he who was crucified. We believe him to be, as the 
prologue to the gospel right back at the beginning verses says, Messiah and Son of God. And we've seen how faithfully he followed his own calling from God right up to his extraordinary, lonely death. But as was said in the three passion predictions, we remember, the Son of Man will be betrayed and suffer and die, and after three days he will rise. God, in a sense, vindicates his faithful servant and beloved son. He has been raised. Don't look for him here. The story doesn't end with his burial. He's alive. He's with us. The young man then tells the women where he is to be found. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. And so he went ahead of the disciples on the road to Jerusalem, you might remember. So now he's going ahead of us into the Galilee. The great place of meeting and mission. Immediately after the Last Supper, he predicted that all the disciples would desert him and abandon him. But then he added, if you remember, I, when I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. This is precisely the message the young man asks the women to give to the disciples and especially to Peter. And it's the message that we're called to hear as well. We've been given so many clues as to who Jesus truly is all through the gospel. We've heard the passion predictions. We know that James and John did actually share the Lord's cup of suffering. And we know that the gospel was preached to all the Gentiles. And we know that, and we know that the resurrection appearances have occurred. So now we are called to go in faith into the Galilee and continue our journey of discipleship. So Mark, in a sense, breaks off the story almost in mid-sentence so that we can add the ending ourselves by the way that we live. This side of the grave, we too, like Jesus, are called to be faithful to the gospel, which will mean taking up our cross and following the Lord. But the faith we have promises that our death is not the end of the story, as it wasn't for Jesus. He has been raised. He goes before us always. And even though we, like the disciples, often fail to live the gospel well, Mark invites us, when we fail, to weep like Peter and accept that we're forgiven and we're called in a, by name into the mission. And the final part is the appendix, the resurrection appearances, chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. There are two endings which later scribes have added to Mark's gospel. Presumably because many were a bit dissatisfied with how Mark had ended his gospel. In chapter in verses one to eight, the shorter uh, ending is one verse, verse nine, and it occurs in some Greek, Latin, Syriac, and Coptic manuscripts. The longer ending is the one that we have. Although the best Greek manuscripts of the fourth century the one discovered on Mount Sinai, and the one that the Vatican has now, don't have it. The longer ending that we have now is a compendium of resurrection appearances. So it's a list almost. To Mary of Magdala, to the two disciples on their way into the country, Luke's Emmaus story. 
to the eleven, which includes the commissioning and the ascension. We see counterparts to each of these four appearances, of course, in the other Gospels. The differences are, that we have in Mark, the appendix, in the commissioning, there are a number of signs accompanying those who believe. They'll drive out demons, they'll speak in new tongues, they'll pick up snakes and drink deadly poison, they'll place their hands on sick people to cure them. So that's a peculiar addition that Mark has. And the second one, in the ascension, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And Brendan Byrne comments, The appendix then exists in some sort of tension, both with the resurrection traditions it summarises and the Gospel of Mark it purports to supplement. It has, however, its own integrity and concludes on this majestic vision of the Gospel sweeping throughout the whole world. And so we end this extraordinary gospel or good news about Jesus, who is Messiah and Son of God. We've seen this Messiah and Son of God in the Galilee, doing, saying extraordinary things, doing extraordinary things. We've seen the opposition to him mount, We've then watched him move from Caesarea Philippi right down to Jerusalem. In the process, teaching us more about what discipleship means in everyday life and how the Messiah, the one we follow, is the one who is to be betrayed and suffer before rising. And then when he enters Jerusalem, we see him face all the groups that he's had to fight against, struggle against, and we've seen him triumph. We have watched him then as he enters his passion, beautifully and powerfully written to us as a drama by Mark. And finally, we've, we realise that this extraordinary figure, whom we love as our Messiah, and God's beloved Son, he who was abandoned so much and died so alone, is risen and is with us. And somehow or other, through all that, we can see in our own suffering and the struggles that we have, the power of the risen Lord. He who is with us and is calling us constantly not to look for him amongst the dead, but because he's living and he's calling us always into mission, into the wonderful world of Galilee, where we see his gospel taking root in the lives of all sorts of people. And we're part of that community, that community of his disciples. Thank you. <laughs>